to do a lot of research amongst the public about their opinions to things. What are some ways of just kind of thinking about this particular episode and how people will process it in regards to the Labour Party, Keir Starmer as a potential Prime Minister? Just give us some pointers. The first thing to say is that in a sense, so um, Sakir is partly now the victim of, of, of being caught uh, on something that in a sense is a cross he made for himself. He has made cl- uh, uh, clamping down on what was regarded as anti-Semitism inside the Labour Party as, as it were, the clearest example of his message that the Labour Party has changed. And of course, he has been very, very keen to argue that the reason why the Labour Party have 20, po- are 20 points ahead in the, in the opinion polls is not really anything to do with Boris Johnson and Partygate or to do with Liz Truss and the fiscal event and everything to do with the transformation of the Labour Party that Secure uh, has uh, brought about. Now, some of us would take us the view, the view that that's a somewhat exaggerated view of why the Labour Party are where they are. But you can see why, given he has made this such a central mantra, this puts him in a certain amount of difficulty. So that's, that's point one mm. I would make. I guess the second point I would make, in a sense, is a point of consolation for the Labour Party, is that if it were true that Labour's 20-point lead rested on the public's view that they look forward to Secure being a brilliant, charismatic prime minister, then this might indeed be a damaging event. But, of course, the truth is that Secure's popularity is not that great. Um, He is actually regarded less favourably than his own party. Um, And to that extent, at least insofar as the public are not necessarily looking forward to Sakir's premiership with a great deal of enthusiasm, um, this this will just simply perhaps reinforce an existing impression. Um, It's also then also worth saying, of course, this is not the first U-turn of the last uh, fortnight or so. We had the one on the 28 billion quid uh, for the Green Investment Plan last week. But it has to be said that the first couple of opinion polls to come out in the wake of that do not suggest it's made any uh, any difference. All of which is perhaps more broadly to say is that, I mean, particularly for those who feel strongly on either the Israeli or the Palestinian side of the argument, this is a subject of great intensity, of great concern. But, you know, YouGov and poll that came out yesterday found that 34% of people just do not know which side they have more sympathy with. Mm. And another 24% said, well, if I have sympathy with anybody, it's with both equally. The, the, the intensity with which this issue is regarded by some who are involved in politics and involved in particular uh, in either the Israeli or Palestinian point of view is not necessarily shared by the wider public, for many of whom probably they regard this as a horrendous episode, but one which, frankly, they don't entirely understand Mm. uh, and they wish that some way or another could be found to resolve the situation. Yeah, there's a lot of kind of data points to untangle there and maybe not quite so obvious as they might seem. I think my big takeaway from what you just said there is, yeah, Keir Starmer's made this huge big thing about, look how much I've changed the Labour Party and solved this issue of anti-Semitism, which is what he would like to, or one of the things he'd like to be judged by. But actually, the public will judge him by whichever metric they want to, and it might not be sure, that but one. Of course, but what it does mean by, by having pursued that, it has made it possible that when, when a, a newspaper like the Daily Mail gets a clip of somebody saying something that might be regarded as anti-Semitic, immediately he's put under pressure. And you can see what he's got three already, three other, already been mentioned, three other MPs already suspended for, again, allegedly anti-Semitic remarks. You can see how, in the sense, therefore, it's creating a rod for his own back. Mm. Um, Aisha, one of the kind of cliches that was doing in the rounds in Westminster the last few months is that Keir Starmer is utterly ruthless and one of the signs of that was just how much discipline he'd installed when it came to selecting candidates for things that proves that that's just not true they might be selecting all sorts of people well i think if you look across the the piece that hasn't been that this has been happening with lots of the candidates that have been selected under keir starmer i mean some of the comments that other MPs have made, they are very much from a different wing of the Labour Party. So I think I feel that that claim is a bit of an overstretch, but I certainly know that people are are really, really upset about this within the the Labour Party. You know, people are going to be doing, you know, looking into, into this situation. I think it is still fair to say that Keir Starmer has made rooting out anti-Semitism a real 
priority for him. And you just look at the, you know, the the battles he's had within the the party. Look at the the big row he's had with Jeremy Corbyn on that. It may well be that Jeremy Corbyn, um, you know, runs in that seat. Islington North could be a very difficult, um, you know, contest for the for the Labour Party. They still haven't chosen a, a candidate there, and and Jeremy Corbyn is expected to win. So I don't think it quite passes the smell test to say that because of this delay by 24 hours that somehow Keir Starmer is really, really weak on anti-Semitism. And you heard that today from Lord Mann, who is the government's own sort of czar on tackling anti-Semitism. He said, look, this is a really unprecedented thing for a political party to pull a candidate and essentially throw away a seat. That is a very, very big deal. We, we should say, I mean, this is not entirely unprecedented. I, don't, I, I admit I can't think of a precedent in a by-election, but it is not unprecedented for political parties to disavow a candidate in a constituency they have a chance of winning. The most obvious recent example is Neil Hanvey in Kirkcaldy in Cowdenbeath in 2019. The SNP disavowed him uh, because of alleged anti-Semitic remarks. Uh, although his vote, shared vote, actually went down slightly and it was the worst SNP performance uh, uh, anywhere in Scotland, he still managed to regain the seat from Labour because Labour's vote went down even more. And Mr Hanvey was then uh, readmitted to the SNP, although he subsequently defected to Alba. Indeed, there was also a Conservative candidate in Leeds in 2019, not one who was quite frankly likely to win. Mm. But um, he was also disavowed by the Conservative Party. He also didn't do that well, but he still over 20 percent of people in the constituency voted for him. So I think so far as the other parties are concerned, I think, you know, a little bit of, um, you know, a bit, be, be he be he who is without sin, be the one who, who casts the first stone. Um, Aisha, I just wanted to pick your brains as a, as a former advisor to, to senior people in the Labour Party like Harriet Harman and Ed Miliband. What would the calculation have been in, in Keir Starmer's office when this first came out? Because to some people, the initial comments were completely beyond the pale and not just worthy of an apology, but were they of like the distancing that ended up happening when the second load of comments came out? Why was the first lot kind of defensible and the second lot not? Because a lot of people would say the first lot weren't defensible. No, I, and there's, I think that I think that's absolutely right. I think the 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 first comments were, you know, to me and many others, absolutely um, terrible to sort of. Uh, the insinuation that that somehow Israel sort of wanted this to happen is a terrible, terrible thing to say. I think what would have been going on in in the sort of uh, strategy or in the room, first of all, would have just been absolute kind of fury about this because of everything we've just talked about. You know, Keir Starmer has made it a really, really big part of his uh, mission to, 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 to try and tackle anti-Semitism. So I think there would have been real fury. I think there would have been real anger as well um, at the candidate for not sort of mentioning this in terms of the the vetting process and then probably that a kind of a, a difficulty thinking right how to manage this because there, there's a the period there was a cutoff period in terms of changing your uh, candidate to end up withdrawing support you know is a big deal i know john's just mentioned two other things but it is it is a big deal and it was a big deal for the labor party because that seat is you know it, it's an important seat for the labor party uh, Rochdale. It has been for a lot. I mean, it's been a controversial seat. But that's where Mrs. Duffy famously had a go at um, Gordon Brown. Mm. So, I mean, that Rochdale is a... It was a Liberal Democrat seat for quite a while, remember, Aisha? People do tend to forget yeah, that. Yeah, but I... Th I difficult, I though, it is to believe the presence of Cyril Smith. <laughs> no, no, oh, yeah, absolutely. But I think particularly because of Tony Lloyd, who's somebody who was really well regarded in the, oh, sure. in, in, in the Labour Party, it was sort of felt that that was a... Um, and also that seat, you know, there was another person that went for that seat, Paul Waugh, a very respected lobby journalist, went for that seat as well. So there was quite a lot of attention on that seat. So I think in the beginning, um, there was probably a feeling where if he, because he apologised very, because he was kind of made to come out and apologise very quickly, they maybe thought that that could nix it. But I think, obviously, they have made the decision that, and of course, this new light has come to, to mm -hmm. this new evidence has come to light. But I think a lot of people would have said, look, if there is a situation like that, you have to be quite consistently tough. The backdrop to this, of course, is that we do know that there is disquiet about the position that Sikir Starmer has taken um, amongst some Labour voters in general, who are certainly much more inclined to back the Palestinian than the Israeli point of view, and certainly amongst Labour's Muslim vote, of which there is a quite a substantial proportion in Rochdale as a constituency with around a 25 to 30% Muslim vote. 
And although the way in which the, those remarks uh, were made by the former Labour candidate uh, may be regarded uh, with disquiet, including by, by many Muslims, perhaps in some sense the, 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 the sense that um, this was somebody who was at least attuned to the plight of people in, uh, in Gaza is not something that would necessarily be entirely uh, 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 mistaken by those uh, of a Muslim point of view. So, you know, the, the problem, for, in a sense, for Labour in disavowing uh, Mr Ali isn't just in Rothschild, it's also the message it sends more broadly to the Muslim community, a Muslim community which, according to polling observation last week, some of whom mm. at least have already decided that they may no longer support Labour because of secure stance on, on Gaza.